So now let's go over the scapulothoracic muscles. We're going to start out with the serratus anterior. The serratus anterior is a really interesting muscle. It actually connects in slips along the top 10 ribs and it goes underneath the scapula and it connects to the medial border. Now this is actually really interesting because actually as it comes around here it also some of the fibers go into the external oblique. But let's look at some of the actions of the serratus anterior. In terms of the actions of the serratus anterior, when the ribs are fixed, the muscle flattens the medial border of the scapula against the rib cage, so it pushes right up against there, with the upper fibers. It pulls the scapula laterally, or abduction, and into upward rotation, so it brings it out a little bit like that. Now, it's kind of an interesting muscle too, because if we consider something like a push-up, in actions such as a push-up, where great force is being exerted by the arms, the serratus anterior muscle keeps the scapula fixed in place, tight against the rib cage. So it really pushes against there to keep it really tight. In such situations, the middle fibers of the trapezius and the serratus contract simultaneously, so fibers above and below here, to actually stabilize the scapula. So a really interesting muscle. What I'd like to talk about now is a very small muscle right underneath the collarbone or the clavicle. This muscle is called the subclavius. The subclavius is a small muscle running from the first rib and its cartilage to the underside of the clavicle. Now, what this muscle does, it depresses the clavicle. The next muscle I'd like to talk about is the pectoralis minor. The pectoralis minor originates from the ribs 3 to 5 and inserts on the coracoid process. The actions of this muscle is that when the ribs are fixed, it pulls the scapula downward and forward, as if to tilt the scapula above the rib cage by lifting the inferior angle upwards. And when the scapula is fixed, it assists in inspiration by elevating the ribs. So let's go over a really interesting muscle called the sternocleidomastoid. This is the largest muscle and the most important anterior muscle of the neck. And with Mickey turning your head to the side here, you can easily see it basically is accentuated with rotation. Now, as the name reflects, it has a dual origin, both on the sternum and the clavicle, basically near the junction of the manubrium. As we travel it, up the side here, we'll see that it inserts on the mastoid process and the curved superior occipital line. Now, if we consider the actions of this muscle, just bring your head forward there, good. When the skull is in a fixed position, the sternocleidomastoid elevates the sternum and the clavicle and thereby assists in inspiration. Go ahead and just bring that up like that. Ah, correct, really good. Okay, when the thoracic cage is fixed, Unilateral contraction of the sternocleidomastoid causes ipsilateral bending and contralateral rotation of the head, as well as extension. Yeah, so this comes back a little bit there and down. Yeah, perfect. Now, bring it back to center. Now, if we get contraction of both muscles on both sides, bilateral contraction, this results in extension of the head and an accentuated cervical lordosis. Just bring it back there. And you can even see how we get a curvature there of the muscle there. So this really helps to increase the curvature of the cervical spine, the lordosis. So the next muscle I'd like to talk about is the levator scapula, outlined here in green. Now, this muscle originates from the transverse processes of C1 to 4, and it inserts on the superior angle of the scapula. Now, the actions of the levator scapula are it, that it elevates the scapula and rotates it downward when the scapula is fixed. It acts also on the cervical spine. The next muscle we'll mention is the rhomboid major and minor. And you can see where this muscle gets its name from, the rhomboid shape of the muscle. Now, the rhomboid muscles originate from the spinous processes 
of the C7 and T1 to T4 and it inserts on the medial border of the scapula. Now, the actions of the rhomboid muscle is that it abducts the scapula and rotates it downward when the scapula is fixed. So the next muscle we're going to go over is the trapezium. Now, as you see, we kind of colored in Mickey's back here, so uh, thank you for donating your body to science today. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, the trapezius is a large, important diamond-shaped muscle. Its origin is on the occiput and the nuchal line, and the spinous processes of the cervical spine and the thoracic spine, all the way down directly to T12. Now, it inserts on the lateral third around the front here, on the clavicle and the acromion for the upper fibers. It also inserts for the middle fibers on the scapular spine and a tubercle at the medial end of the scapular spine. The orientation of these fibers varies greatly. As you see, some of the fibers are inferior lateral and others are superior lateral. Now, in terms of the actions, simultaneous contraction of all fibers adducts the scapula, brings it in. Now, the upper fibers by themselves act in elevation and upward rotation of the scapula. The lower fibers by themselves act in depression and upward rotation of the scapula. A really interesting muscle. Let's take a look at the muscles involved in specific movements of the scapula. In order to visualize this, my hand is representing the scapula, so I've placed it just on top of Mickey's scapula to help illustrate the movements. The first motion is elevation, an upward movement. The muscles involved here would be the upper trapezius, rhomboids, and levator scapulae. Now, the second movement is depression, a downward movement. The muscles involved, lower trapezius, and the lower serratus anterior. The next movement, abduction, moving out towards the side. The serratus anterior is the primary muscle involved here. Moving in the opposite direction, adduction, we have the trapezius and the rhomboids performing this action. Looking at rotation, we have upward rotation, involves the serratus anterior, the upper trapezius and lower trapezius, and then downward rotation would involve the rhomboids and the levator scapula. So the next muscle we're going to go over is the subscapularis. Let's just bring Mickey's arm up here. Now, we have to go actually fairly deep here to the anterior side of the scapula because the subscapularis originates from the anterior surface of the scapula and it inserts farther up on the humerus in the lesser tubercle of the humerus. It fibers converge at the lateral angle of the scapula. Now, in terms of the actions of the subscapularis, it is the principal muscle of medial rotation of the arm. Let's bring your arm down here. Okay. So, internal rotation or medial rotation. So that is the primary muscle involved in that action. So the next muscle we'll go over is the supraspinatus, shown in green here. Now, the supraspinatus originates from the supraspinous fossa on the posterior scapula. Its tendon passes under the acromion, acromioclavicular joint, and the ligament which connects the corcoid process to the acromion, so farther to the lateral side here. And it inserts at a highest point on the greater tubercle of the humerus. Now, there is a large bursa which is basically a closed sac of synovial fluid, surrounding its tendon and separating it from the inferior surface of the acromion and the deltoid muscle. This bursa acts as an axillary component of the glenohumeral joint. Adhesions here can restrict mobility of the shoulder. Now, in terms of the actions, it helps to abduct the arm. Just come up here a little bit, Mickey. Just go in arm into abduction there, and down. Good. Now, it's a weak abductor, but it's coupled with the action of the deltoid muscle. The next muscle I'd like to go over is the infraspinatus. Now, the infraspinatus here in blue 
originates from the infraspinous fossa. Its tendon passes above the capsule of the glenohumeral joint and inserts over here on the greater tubercle at a point posterior inferior to the insertion of the supraspinatus muscle. Now, the actions for the infraspinatus are lateral rotation and it also participates in abduction. The next muscle lure is the one in green here. Now this is the teres minor. Now the teres minor originates from the lateral border of the scapula or the posterior surface and inserts on the greater tubercle below the insertion of the infraspinatus. In terms of the action of the teres minor, it is a lateral, involved in lateral rotation. Let's talk a bit about the rotator cuff muscles. Now, collectively, these four deep muscles, the subscapularis, which is on the anterior, the supraspinatus, right in this area, infraspinatus, and the teres minor, are collectively called the rotator cuff muscles. Now, their tendons surround and reinforce the shoulder joint capsule on three sides. But apart from the action of mobilizing the humerus, they also play an important role as active ligaments in providing mobility to the joint. Now, if we first look at the supraspinatus, which is right in through here, it helps to prevent the humerus from being dislocated upwards. So, that would be the supraspinatus right there. Now, if we look at the infraspinatus, down in this area here, and the teres minor as well from here, they help to prevent uh, the humerus from being dislocated forward. Now if we look at the subscapularis, if you think of the shoulder blade, the scapula, as this triangle that's formed here, the subscapularis would be on the anterior aspect of that, and it helps to prevent the head of the humerus from gliding backwards in this direction. So this shows that the shoulder is a joint whose bony structure and passive attachments such as the capsule and the ligaments are slightly weak stabilizing structures. The main stabilizing force comes from the action of these periarticular muscles in this area. Let's discuss the pectoralis major. Now, the pectoralis major has two heads. One coming off the anterior part of the medial clavicle, the clavicular head, and the other coming from the sternal costal area here, the costal cartilages, one through six, as well as rib seven. Now, the two heads converge and attach into the humerus. The clavicular head actually attaches slightly below the sternal costal head on the lateral aspect of the bicipital groove. Let's talk about the actions of the pectoralis major. Now, when the rib cage is fixed, all the muscles help to adduct, adduct the arm, and immediately rotate. So we'll have Mickey demonstrate. Now, this is the hugging muscle. There you go. Yeah, so perfect demonstration of its action. Now, if the shoulder is fixed, it actually helps to depress the clavicle from the superior fibers, while the inferior fibers actually assist in inspiration. Let's discuss the latissimus dorsi muscle. Now, we've taped off the borders of the muscle in this purple tape here. Uh, latissimus dorsi means widest back muscle, and it originates from the sacral and iliac crests, as well as the thoracolumbar fascia, and the spinous processes of T1 through 12, and the posterior surfaces of the lower four ribs. Now, the tendon wraps around the medial side of the humerus and it makes a twist as it inserts on the bicipital groove. The actions of the latissimus dorsi are extension, adduction, and medial rotation of the arm. When acting bilaterally, the latissimus dorsi extend the thoracolumbar spine. That's it? That's it. Let's discuss the deltoid. 
Now, the deltoid is a superficial muscle which gives the shoulder its characteristic shape. It consists of three groups of fibers. The middle fibers attach to the lateral border of the acromion, the posterior fibers attach to the spine of the scapula, notably at the inferior portion of the posterior border, and the anterior fibers attach to the clavicle around the lateral third of the anterior scapula border. Now, these three groups of fibers converge towards the middle of the arm and insert on the lateral surface of the humerus.